You better watch out, you better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list, he's checking it twice, he's going to find out who's naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. Well, I bet you didn't expect that. <laughs> yeah, Santa Claus is coming to town. And I hope he came to town for your family. But have you ever really listened to the lyrics of that song? And I know for some of you, this is something you've thought about for many years. But it's really awful. The lyrics of that song are, I don't know. Let me read them to you. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. And I'm telling you why, because Santa Claus is coming to town. So don't do any of those naughty things, because Santa's coming. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty or nice. So he's got a list, and he's really diligent about this list. And that list determines who's naughty or who's nice. And watch out, because he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. It's just terrible. And the thing is, guys, it is completely in sync with the world in which we live. Absolutely. In fact, if I were to be completely honest and look at the past 19 plus years of my parenting, it's probably pretty in sync with how I was as a dad. Now that's sober. Welcome back, guys. It's uh, Sunday the 3rd, and I want to wish you a happy new year. I want to wish you a happy 2021. Welcome to 2021. This is going to be different, and I know we're all glad to see the back of 2020, um, but what we want to do well in our Sunday mornings is start well. We want to start 2021 with some proper fuel for a proper year. Now, who knows? 2021 could see stuff kick off that's far worse than we saw in 2020. I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying I don't have any crystal ball. And there's a lot going on in this world. But how we begin will either prepare us or not prepare us for what this year has to share with us. We are stepping back into the conversation that we paused at the end of November. The Jesus you've never known. And we are going to continue this right through Easter. Because I just feel like this is where we as a people need to be right now. And during the month of January, we're going to have a very specific emphasis in this conversation about Jesus. We're going to talk about his love. And we're going to talk about it, hopefully, in a way that gets inside and shakes you to the core. So i got a question I want to ask you guys. All right. This is going to be a brief sesh this morning, but I want to start with this question. Santa Claus is coming to town. The world, the system that it describes is the system of merit. It's the system of earning. It's the system of deserving. Is that the system, for lack of a better word, I could call it an economy. 
I can call it uh, an approach or a perspective. But it's not the system in which you are living. Good stuff happens if you're a good boy or a good girl. And if you don't, you don't have any right to expect anything but difficulty. Or perhaps even punishment. And I just want to stop you, because I have had this conversation with people who have attended church. And I use those words very specifically. For more than 40 years, who are still living in a system of earning or deserving or merit. And they have not allowed the truth of Jesus of Nazareth, whose birth we just celebrated, to invade the system in which they live and transform it. And we cannot enter into 2021 with all that it has for us without tearing down that system and moving out and then moving in to the system he wants to build for us. And that is the system of love. We are invited into a world constructed in love where every breath we take is pure grace and this is really crucial at the end of 2020 I got to tell you and I got to tell you because this pandemic has heaped shame on all of us shame has been right there now what I mean by shame is there's such a thing as guilt where we think we did a bad thing shame is you're a bad person. You're not an adequate person. It is actually something that smears and, and maligns our very character and being and personality. And the pandemic has heaped buckets of that stuff on us. Parents, tell me that you have not spent Significant, some significant amounts of time worrying if you're doing enough to help your kids with the home learning and the online schooling. Or that perhaps you let them watch um, technology on their phone or their, their pads or whatever, or play too many video games. Tell me that you haven't felt shame about your parenting. Or maybe some of you, like me, feel shame about the weight you've gained because you eat your feelings and you're either bored or stressed or just like food. And you've put on a few pounds. And when you look in the mirror, you feel shame. Or what about businesses, own, business owners? Maybe some of you, or in your career, or in your work, your business went out, went bankrupt, or had to shut down, or had to depend upon government subsidies and handouts to just keep it from folding. Something you'd never experienced before. So as a business leader, or as a business owner, you have felt like... I can't succeed. See, one of the things the pandemic did to all of us is it removed all of the measuring sticks. It removed what our culture calls metrics, the way we measure success. And so you don't know if you're doing well. I can say that honestly as a church leader, that I don't know if I'm being effective, and all I know is if I spend time with Jesus and allow him to help me understand, I do that. But I don't know if I'm succeeding. And when I don't have that constant metric reinforcing, well, I default to the fact that I'm probably not succeeding. I begin to feel like a failure. And shame begins to creep back in. This is the situation in which we start this year. And we can't ignore it. We can't blank it. Because the shame builds up. And it tries to tell us who we are. 
And let me just park there for a second. The shame tries to tell us who we are. Some of you know that's true. Some of you feel like failures. Some of you don't know if you're not. I woke up from a dream on Christmas Eve. I can't tell you a thing about the dream. But I had two little phrases. And I, and I felt like the Lord was telling me something for the month of January. This is it. It does not matter what you do. It matters who you are. It is not about what you do or are doing. What matters is who you are. And I believe that that's what he wants to do in you and in me this month. He wants to take us out of the system of merit, and deserving, and earning. He wants to take us out of the town that Santa Claus is coming to. And he wants us to live in a new system, in a new town. A town that is constructed by his love and where the oxygen we breathe is pure grace. You are beloved. You are pursued. You are desired without doing a single thing. I just want you to stop. <sighs> Exhale. And just allow that to wash over you. You are beloved. Do this for me. Close your eyes. Give a big exhale. And hear these words. You are beloved. You are pursued. You are are desired without doing a single thing. Now, how do I know this? How do I know this? I know this because Jesus said that it is the rationale for Christmas and Easter and everything that comes in between and after. The whole reason that God sent his son is love. Now, I've had a lot of preachers tell us that, you know, the key is what we do with it. You know, through Christ, we are loved. And that's true. We come into an experience of that love because of the cross of Jesus Christ when we open ourselves to that, when we put our trust in his sacrifice for us. Absolutely, you come to experience it. But even before that, you are loved. Okay? You are beloved. You are pursued. You are desired without doing a single thing. That's who you are. You are beloved. And I'm going to read this verse to you that you know I'm going to read. You just you can you can hear it in your head already. For this is how much God loved the world. This is from the Passion Translation, by the way. For this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift. So now, everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life, eternal life, that kind of life, Zoe life, that comes from God alone. But the first half of the verse says something different than the second half of the verse. The first half of the verse says this, For this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift. Then the second half says, So that now everyone who believes in him, who puts their trust in him, will never perish, but experience eternal life. That's the heart of the verse. But don't miss the first half. For this is how much God loved the world. 
everyone in the world. Before they chose to believe in him, he sent his son. <laughs> is that good or is that good? I want to invite you guys in this month to live in the realm of love. It is not what you do. It is who you are. You are a child created in the image of God. And from all eternity, you were in his imagination. Beloved. That is who you are. A few nights ago, we ran out of milk. And the only place that was open, it was Sunday night. The only place that was open uh, was the local, Sainsbury's local. So I got in the car and headed over and I parked. And there was a guy there um, sitting in a sleeping bag. And it was cold. And I immediately felt for the guy. I jumped out of the car and he said, hey, do you have any change? And I didn't. I don't tend to carry change or cash or anything. I just use cards nowadays. I said, sorry, man, I don't. And I went inside and I got my stuff. I came back out. And I said to him, I said, what are you, you know, what are you looking for, mate? You know, the obvious expectation is this guy wants to buy some booze or wants to buy some drugs or what have you. And he said, I just want to get enough money to be able to stay in a hostel tonight. It's way too cold. And that's one of the horrible things of the pandemic. There's no winter shelter. And it was horrific. And I believed him. Am I naive? Maybe. But I believed him. So I had to do something about it. So I said, how much does it cost to stay in a, a hostel? And I went over and I got, I got a tenner out of the bank machine and I brought it over to him. And I said, how close does that get you? And he said, I, I'm almost there. I said, All I need is another four ninety five, and I can stay. Thank you so much. And, and he was going to stay there and continue to panhandle until he got that extra four ninety five. So I said, hold on. I went and got the the rest and brought it over to him. And I said to him, I just, I, I felt prompted and I just said these words to him because again, a couple of nights before I'd had this dream and, and I just said to him, mate, you are a child of God. You don't deserve to be out here. This isn't the place for you sitting out on the streets freezing. You are a child of God. And when I said those words to him, something in his eyes changed. You know, maybe I'm, am, am I making that up? Perhaps. Is that wishful thinking? Perhaps. Was he just, you know, working me? Maybe. But I thought I saw something change in his eyes. I thought, so, I, thought I saw recognition. Recognition that somewhere deep down he knows that's, how, that's who he is. That the God who created him thinks that way about him. And he'd lost, he'd lost track of that. Like it was, it was, it felt like a fresh word for him. And he got up and he started packing up his sleeping bag and all of that. And he was going to walk over to the Greyfriars um, place to stay. Shelter. Um, and I wish I could have done more. I drove away probably feeling inadequate with what I've been able to do. One night's one night. But, but I think the most important thing that happened is that that man was told who he is. And I, it was a privilege to be able to play that role that evening. And I don't tell you that so that you know what I did. That, that's, you all do that all the time. But something went on in his eyes. And that's why I'm sharing this this morning. For this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift. This is how much God loved the world. Before they had chosen to do with anything with that. Love. Love. Love comes before our response. You are beloved. You are pursued. You are desired. Without doing a single thing. Now listen. I was on a walk today and I was thinking about this and something rose up in me. And and I just I just want I want to share it with you and it is from a heart of love, okay? But please stop nodding right now. 
you do not understand this. I do not understand this. Have you heard this before? Maybe. Have I heard this before? Definitely. Do I understand it? No. Please. You do not get this. I do not get this. Sit back in awe and allow it to amaze you, to stun you, to gobsmack you. Maybe for the first time. But for goodness sake, don't be over familiar with this. Because you and I, you and I would be freer than we are right now. If we knew this, if we knew this, um, Anthony Campbell says this uh, in his book, God first loves us. Originally, I believe the acceptance of a loving God involved a sufficient, but relative minor shift of attitude. After all, it was on so many people's lips. The more I worked with it, the more I realized that the acceptance in faith of God's unconditional love was not only hugely significant, but it required a major change of attitude. The major shift may be the images we have of God and ourselves. How radically is our image of God reshaped if we take seriously the belief in God as deeply, passionately, and unconditionally loving us? And I love the use of the word loving us because it's ongoing and active. How radically must we rework our own self-image if we accept ourselves as lovable, as loved, as deeply, passionately and unconditionally loved by God. <laughs> That's why I'm asking you to just stop nodding and stop taking this message and setting it in the files with all the other sermons or talks you've heard about the love of God. Because the first half of John 3.16 is the fundamental revelation that has to happen before Christianity begins. Not before you're saved, but before Christianity begins. I look back at my notes, and, and last January, I gave a talk very similar on the love of the Father. He's not changing the subject. And I think that's because we don't know it yet. This is where it starts. I'm going to close with Brennan Manning. And as I said, this is his book, All is Grace. All is Grace. It's the last book he wrote. He wrote it just before he passed away. This is uh, starting at page 188, right at the end. I have said countless times that losing our illusions is difficult. Because illusions are the stuff we live by. You know, that's, that's what the pandemic did. It took our illusions away from us. It took our ability to have our illusions continue to define us. It took it away from us. And so losing our illusions is difficult because illusions are the stuff we live by. We're a success. We're effective. We're climbing the ladder. The last few years have been a stripping away like I've never experienced. He was uh, dying of cancer at this point. About all I'm left with now is rags. Somewhat fitting, I guess, for a man who has preached such a gospel. If I ever was a ragamuffin, I am now. For ragamuffins, God's name is Mercy or in the present vernacular of my life. Help. Nowadays, if I want to put on my jeans and shirt, someone has to help me. If I want to eat a slice of pizza or an ice cream cone, someone has to help me. If I have to go to the bathroom, I need help. To turn up the volume on the Yankees game, I need help. To access my medicine or open my Diet Coke, I must have help. To get into bed at night, help. 
to rise in the morning, help, to nap in the afternoon, help, to write this book, help. Carlo Corretto wrote, we are what we pray. These are days of prayer without ceasing. Help me, have mercy on me. And my father, who is so very fond of me, does. You're not a success. I'm not a success. I am beloved. And you are beloved. You are pursued, and I am pursued. You are desired, and I am desired, without doing a single thing. That's how I want to invite you to start 2021. Let them love you. Let the illusions by which you lived and whose absence you have grieved this past year, let them fall to the ground and let the only thing that defines you be his love for you. That's my prayer for me and that's my prayer for you in 2021. 